Hey brothers and sisters, welcome back to the Behaviour Revolution Scriptures. This is our last episode of Judges. Well done. You've made it all through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and now Judges. And uh, today's video is very, very disturbing. It's a story about uh, violence, sexual abuse, gang rape, and it all leads to massive judgment and a civil war. And uh, it's very, very disturbing content here today. And I mean, that's the point. All of these chapters have been pretty disturbing, haven't they? Looking at the character and the behavior of Yahushua's people, Yishra. These are the people blood bought, you know, called out of Egypt, delivered from Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb. And look, only a few short hundred years later, they are playing the whore big time. But we've still got lots and lots of um, books and chapters to go before they're completely divorced. But you can see already that they're, they're kind of no hopers, aren't they? They will not obey Yahushua. And so it's uh, a mirror, if you will. It's paralleling what goes on today in the 21st century. No one's interested in this truth, are they? Very few and far between. If you run into somebody that's even mildly interested or open, receptive to it, you nearly have a heart attack, don't you? Someone who's like a sponge without any argument, whew, that never happens. So let's go into the text today. This is our last three chapters of Judges. So there's a, quite a bit of writing, but let's go there. I've put it together kind of in a hurry. I apologize, there might be a couple of spelling mistakes. This is the last day I've got with my old trusty green screen behind me because my salon is sold and uh, money should be coming through tonight and I may not have to come here ever again. I might have to pop up in the morning to exchange the keys and everything, but I'm out of here. So we'll be doing a, I'll be doing a completely different thing with the sound and the green screen in our next chapter, which will be a few short chapters of Ruth. And uh, anyway, enough about me. Let's go to gang rape and war. Gang rape and war. Very disturbing this. This story probably took place even earlier than the story of Micah, the silver image of Yusha, and the Levite who masqueraded as his priest. That was our last few chapters, remember? Micah and the Levite who was masquerading as a priest and the silver idol. Isn't that insanity? This story represents one of the most infamous outrages against Yahusha that is recorded in set apart scripture, like it's his fault. Yeah. One that authors of scriptural writings of much later eras referred to because so well known and repeated was this sad episode. It's one of the stories that atheists or secular people hold up and say, this is why the scriptures are hideous and wrong and this is why you shouldn't worship this creator. I don't know, look how sadistic and like, like this is Yahushua's fault. You know, like just because it's written in the scripture didn't mean Yahushua had anything to do with it. Some of these books as we've learned are full of nonsense and lies because they're, they're just accurate record, records of the people they're talking about. The theme of the book of Judges begins the story. There was no king in Israel. There was no law and order because there was no central authority. Although this traveling Levite who we're about to meet, living in the hills of Ephraim sounds an awful lot like our previous story. It's not the same fellow. So I've got another traveling Levite again. Just like with Micah, there was a traveling Levite. There's a traveling Levite that we're about to read about. It's not the same fellow though, but it does illustrate that Micah's Levite priest was not an isolated instance at all. It had become quite common for Levites to seek position and advancement wherever it could be found because their support system, their network, and what was supposed to be going on in the tabernacle was falling apart. Partly their fault and partly Israel wouldn't respect them or do what they were instructed. So let's go to the scriptures, chapter 19. Before kings ruled Yisrael, a Levite who had no tribal land of his own was living deep in the hill country of the Ephraim tribe. And he took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But they had massive drama and she buggered off back to her family's home in Bethlehem. Some translations say she was unfaithful. Other translations say she played the whore. She had whorish behavior. Um, it, it sounds more like, and we'll explain why, they just had a bit of a blue, a bit of drama. 
The setup is that this anonymous Levite living in the more northern area of Ephraim had taken on a concubine whose family home was in Bethlehem of Judah, meaning that she was not a Levite, but a Jew, Judahite, Judahite. But at some point there was a serious problem and the woman left him and went back to her father. The CJB, along with the King James Version and many others say that the concubine cheated on her Levite husband, or some say outright that she played the harlot or acted like a whore. Now in the Hebrew, the latter translation is absolutely correct one because the Hebrew word used, used to describe her is that she was a zona, meaning a prostitute. Or in some manuscripts that she behaved zena, which means she acted in a whorish manner. So, however, other translations will say she was angry with her husband and left him. So the translations that say she acted in a whorish way or cheated on him or was unfaithful are not incorrect because that is the original term, zona or zena, which is it's either I mean, she's not a prostitute, but she's having whorish behavior, so she, maybe she did cheat on him. However, other translations will say she was angry with her husband and left him. And those are equally good translations because they are drawn from ancient Aramaic texts, which speak of anger and not cheating sexual immorality. The general consensus of ancient sages is that the Levite and his concubine had an argument of some kind, and she had not been unfaithful to him, at least not sexually speaking, the reason is that by both the instructions given to Moses and also the customs and traditions of that era, a concubine or wife who had an adulterous affair was to be executed. And there is no hint in this story that she was in any way, uh, there is no hint in this story that she was in any danger of being harmed, not by her husband anyway. So that's why I come to the conclusion, and it could be wrong, you can make up your own mind, some translations say she was hoary, cheated on him. But uh, in this one we've just gone with they had massive drama. Maybe the massive drama was because she played the whore. Anyway, they had massive drama and she's buggered off back to her family. Remember that a concubine or pelagesh in Hebrew was like a second class wife. So it was common for the scripture to refer to the man as her husband. Simply speaking, the difference between a concubine and a wife was that the wife had more rights. Now, whenever I used to hear the word concubine, I thought it was pretty much like a, a harlot, like a prostitute almost. It was like the husband was cheating on his wives. But not so, not in this era. I mean, we heard about uh, Jacob's servant wives. Half of the tribes of Israel were from Jacob's servant wives. So um, they were just a second class of wife. Why, why, they, why they didn't become real wives, who knows? Maybe, uh, and we've discussed this before, that maybe they weren't Hebrews, you know. It was common for the scripture to refer to a man's husband. Simply speaking, the difference between a concubine and a wife was that the wife had more rights and had a marriage contract. But concubines were not slaves, nor could be mistreated any more than could a legal wife. They were not acquired as playful sex objects or mistresses as is sometimes wrongly de wrongfully depicted. They were often acquired to have children with, extend the family and the wealth. So, so they've had drama and she's buggered off to her family. Four months later, her husband decided to try and talk her into coming back home. He went to Bethlehem, taking along a servant and two donkeys, and he talked with his wife and she invited him into her family's home. Her father was glad to see him and didn't want him to leave. So the man stayed three days eating and drinking with his father-in-law. So, it doesn't sound like the aftermath of a cheating, scandalous affair, does it? Yeah. Adulterous relationship, it sounds more like they've had drama. To me, anyway. The fact that she brought her husband into her father's home shows that whatever caused the split up was restorable. And it also says that her father was glad to meet him. Translation, the father was very relieved that his daughter would be going back with her husband. I say that, I say that not in the sense it probably sounds to us today, as though he wanted to get rid of his daughter, but rather in the sense that it was very dishonorable for a family to have a girl get married or become a concubine and then become separated from her husband. If, Yahushua forbid, the separation grew to an outright divorce, it brought great shame upon the whole family, regardless of the reason of who might be to blame. 
So dear old dad had been sweating it out, obviously. So he's loving up this son, loving up this guy. Take my daughter back. He didn't want the status of having a divorced daughter. Divorced daughter. And when everyone got up in the morning on the fourth day, the Levites started getting ready to go home. But his father-in-law said, don't leave yet, son. Stay and have a bite to eat first. You'll need the strength for your journey. So the two men sat down together and ate a big meal. Come on, the father-in-law said, stay tonight and have a good time. And the Levite tried to leave, but his father-in-law insisted and he spent one more night there. Then on the fifth day, the man got up early to leave, but his wife's father said, you need to keep up your strength. Why don't you leave right after lunch? So the two of them started eating again. Finally, the Levite got up from the meal so that he and his wife and servant could leave. Look, his father-in-law said, it's already late afternoon and if you leave now, you won't get very far before dark. So stay with us one more night and enjoy yourself. Then you can get up early tomorrow morning and start home. But the Levite decided not to spend the night there again. He had the saddles put on his donkeys and he and his wife and servant traveled as far as Jebus, which, which is now called Jerusalem. It was beginning to get dark and the man's servant said, let's stop and spend the night in this town where the Jebusites live. No, the Levite answered, they aren't Israelites, so I don't want to stay there. We can, make, we can make it to Gibeah before dark, so we'll stop there for the night. We might even make it to Ramah. Interesting that he didn't want to stay anywhere that wasn't run by Israelites. But when you find out what happens, he might have been better off going to the Canaanites. When you look at just how disgusting the Israelites have become, he might have been safer going to the Canaanites. Anyway, they walked on and reached Gibeah in the territory of Benjamin, just after sunset. But they couldn't find a house where anyone would let them spend the night. And they sat down in the open area just inside the town gates. This was a sacred duty in that era and the failure of the local residents to offer rest and sustenance to a traveler, especially one who obviously had the means to feed himself and his animals if needs be was a sign that these people were a very poor character. So they're sitting out in the open court. Soon an old man came in through the gates on his way home from working in the fields. Most of the people who lived in Gibeah belonged to the tribe of Benjamin, but this man was originally from the hill country of Ephraim. He noticed that the Levite was just in town to spend the night. Where are you going? The old man asked. Where'd you come from? We've come from Bethlehem in Judah. The Levite answered, we went there on, uh, on a visit. Now we're going to the place where Yahura is worshipped and later we will return home in the hill country of Ephraim. But no one here will let us spend the night in their home. We brought food for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, so we don't need anything except a place to sleep. And the old man said, you guys are more than welcome to spend the night in my home and to be my guest, but quickly come inside. Don't stay out here, it's not safe. So the old man brought them into his house and fed their donkeys. Then he and his guests washed their feet and began eating and drinking. They were having a good old time when some wicked men of that town surrounded the house and started banging on the door and shouting, a man came to your house tonight, send him out so we can have sex with him. Talk about deja vu, remember Lot? having this same experience in Sodom with the messengers of Yahushua that appeared in the town. The same thing happened to Lot. The old man went outside and said, my friends, please don't commit such a horrible crime against a man who is a guest in my house. Let me send out my virgin daughter or this man's concubine instead. Have your way with them and do whatever else you want, but please don't do such a horrible thing to this man for he's a guest under my roof. Now, if your, skin, if your skin is crawling reading that, let's discuss that a bit. I mean, it's not gonna get any better. Hashtag me too. Guest lives matter, guest lives matter. Let's first look at why the old man offered the women to these depraved assholes. Remember, the Oriental Middle Eastern mindset at this point concerning hospitality. Among the several things 
The hospitality included in this era was protection of the house guest, no matter what, no matter what, it was paramount protection. There was no greater shame than for a host to allow something terrible to happen to his guest while in his home. Hosts were obligated by custom to defend their guests with the cost of their own lives or their family's lives if necessary. Just as families today have set up an unspoken hierarchy whereby the children are protected at all costs by the adult family members, and even the younger children are protected almost out of instinct by the older ones, it was the same sort of thing with families that took in travellers whom they had never met before. I thought that was a good illustration, that. Part of the custom, just protect people under your own roof. Why didn't he offer himself, though, instead of throwing the women out? So the old man offers to send out his own unmarried daughter, a virgin or maiden, as well as the Levite's concubine for them to gang rape in trade for keeping the males safe. Why though? Not very me too, is it? The women would be up in arms today, wouldn't they? No way, they'd be having a fisticuff. Send the husband out, send the husband out, gang rape him. In ancient times, and still in many Eastern societies today, including the more fundamental sects of Islam, women are chatel. Women have far less value than men, and very often, sadly, less value than even the farm animals. The divine instructions given to Moses were the first to value women equally with men, and to insist on the humane treatment of women and to give women far more rights than they had ever had before. Don't get me wrong, the scripture still presents a hierarchy whereby men are to be the authority, but men are to be an authority over women in love and for the purpose of caring for women, not for the purpose of using them harshly or virtually enslaving them. I thought that was interesting. It was revolutionary what Yahushua gave to, to Moses, the instructions. It was never heard of for women to be treated so fairly. And I'm not gonna go into it because we dealt with it back in Leviticus and Numbers, the instructions we went through. But it was very uplifting for women. And uh, however, worldwide customs and traditions infiltrate everything. And the Hebrew society remained a male dominated society. What we see happening in this regard to the women in this story is not acceptable at all to Yahushua. So when we read this, don't at all think Yahushua is behind this or accepting this or anointing somebody to do this. No way. This is completely abominable behavior. The fact that they're men coming on and asking for the man to gang rape, the fact that they're getting into sodomy and they're homosexuals is, you know, abomination number one or two or three, you know, a lot, it's up there with, you know, drinking blood and tree worship and all the other ones, Moloch and Baal and all of them. It's one of the top 10 of list of abominations that Yahushua hates. No gray area. You do them, you're done. So, not acceptable to Yahushua. None of this is acceptable to Yahushua. What makes this story so extraordinarily shocking is certainly that sodomy homosexuality is at the center of it, which is undeniably at the top of the list. Yeah, I just said it. Of behave to Yahushua. But what we must also see is that while we've witnessed this all before in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, at least the residents of those cities were pagans. This is where the mind baffles. At least Sodom and Gomorrah were all pagans. They're all, you know, wicked. They weren't believers. They weren't Hebrews. They were pagans. They didn't know Yahushua. But the men of Gibeah, who are demanding homosexual sex with the old man's male guest here in the book of Judges, are Hebrews. They are Benjamites. They had the living instructions in them. Their parents were part of the Exodus. Joshua had only recently died. This mob consisted of Yahushua's set apart people who were no more than one, maybe two generations removed from Moses. See how far they've become already? If they ever changed at all, you know. It's a constant reminder when you look at the world today, when you look at those who hold themselves up, whether they call themselves Jews or the Judaism or the no, Orthodox, whatever they want to call themselves, claiming their heritage, 
This is the heritage of Yahushua's people back here. Don't be looking at the glory and the splendor and the wonderful, bright, shiny days of Moses and Joshua. Look here. This is what Yahushua's people were doing. And still are. So, he's just offered the women to them. Please don't do such a thing to the guest under my roof. So we understand now the culture that he was living in. It's just a normal thing to do, offer. Don't let anything happen to the guests. But the savage men refused to listen and became violently hostile. So the Levite grabbed his concubine and took her outside to them. And the wicked men gang raped her and abused her all night long. We don't know how many men there were, but there was a crowd and they all had a turn. They gang raped her all night long, abused her all night long. Finally, they let her go just before sunrise and it was almost daybreak when she went back to the house where they'd been staying and she collapsed at the front door and lay there until sunrise. About that time, her husband woke up and got ready to leave. But when he opened the front door and went outside, he found his concubine lying at the door with her hands on the doorstep. Get up, he said, it's time to leave. Now he knows what's happened to her. He's the one who threw her out to the wolves. Didn't even come looking for her, you know. What a bloody punts. What a weak, sick ass man. And now he has no compassion or kindness toward her. Get up, it's time to leave. But she didn't move for she'd died from the injuries she'd sustained. So he lifted her body onto his donkey and left. Gotta love these Levites, hey? It's not only the horrific action of the men of Gibeah that are on display here, but the callous and cold heart of the Levite who is utterly indifferent to his concubine's suffering. In fact, the entire reason for the Levite going after his concubine, after she angrily left him and went home to her father, was probably selfish anyway. He preferred to have her company, obviously, than not, but that's about as far as it went. Perhaps he thought her leaving him would be an embarrassment. That he went to Bethlehem to fetch her back with gifts and a donkey for her to ride home was simply the price needed for him to get her back, a price he could afford with little discomfort. But that price certainly didn't include any risk taking or repentance on his part. Nor did it mean that he would love her and protect her. What an asshole. This wickedness in Gibeah would long be remembered and mentioned many centuries later in Hosea 9 and 10. So great was the shame it brought upon all Yisrael. But get this, it doesn't end. When the Levite got home, he took a very sharp knife and cut her body into 12 pieces. He's thrown his concubine's wife on his horse, donkey, and gone home. Then when he got home, he cut her body into 12 pieces. Then he told his messengers, take one of her piece, take one of her pieces to each tribe of Israel. Take one piece of it to each tribe of Israel and ask anyone, ask everyone, if anything so utterly disgusting like this has ever happened since Yisrael left Egypt. Tell him to damn well think about it. Talk it over and speak up. Do something about this sort of behavior, in other words. And everyone who saw a piece of the body said, how horrible, nothing so abominable as this has ever happened since the day Yisrael left Egypt. So he's, he's just beside himself. He's seeing red, he's in a rage to the point where he's so indignant, he cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends her off to all the 12 tribes as an example of what's going on. But look at his behavior as well. You know? The Levite obviously had no regard for his concubine before or after her death. The fact that he would cut her body is a terrible desecration that is simply not allowed by tourist standards. She was not to be, she was, she was to be properly buried not used as a means for this Levite to display his anger, but the Hebrew word used for cutting up, or better, dividing her body into pieces, is a word that is normally reserved for tabernacle ritual. The word is natak, 
meaning to divide up the sacrificial animal into pieces for putting onto the altar of ascending the offerings. The fact that it is used here is out of place and so seems to indicate that the Levite had some delusional sense of piety or righteous anger or twisted belief that if he was the one doing the cutting up, because he was a Levite, that it made it a proper ceremonial act. Isn't this dreadful? This is a man's daughter. He just spent days and days with this, with this man's father, with this concubine's father. This is someone's daughter. Imagine running into the guy or visiting him. Oh, what happened to her? She died. Oh, why didn't you tell us? What happened to her body? Can we visit? No, I cut her up and sent her around 12 places. Like, how disgusting, you know? You know how superstitious and into the death rituals they were back here. Taken together with the other young Levite of our previous story, who allowed himself to become a priest. Remember the story of Micah and the priest? The Levite priest, who, uh, the, the Levite who allowed himself to become a priest when he was not of the proper lineage. And even to worship Teraphim, Yahushua idols. And then that he would leave Micah for a better offer to go be a priest for the tribe of Dan and set up cult worship in Laish paints a pretty bad picture of the Hebrew priestly leaders in the era of the judges. Do you understand that? We're using the example of the last priest that Mike was dealing with, who just sold him out for a better job, setting up idols. And now this priest today, this Levite, I should say. See, the Levites were the butchers of that era. The Levites were the butchers of that era. They were highly trained in just how to dissect an animal for sacrificial purposes. And then later on, how to prepare an animal for food, according to clean or unclean traditions that slowly developed. Even today, it is usually Levites who will run kosher butcher shops. This Levite man simply applied his butchering skill to his dead concubine for personal reasons. Things like this don't go unnoticed, and the question, the question on everyone's minds was what to do about all this. What should be done about the homosexual men in Gibeah who literally gang raped this concubine to death? But also, what should be done about the tribe of Benjamin in general, who apparently didn't show enough interest in the matter to bring these men to justice? And that's what's dealt with next. Isn't this disgusting? Look at what's happening in Yisrael. They're not interested in Yahushua's instructions. As though it's heavy, it's burdensome. Oh, we're not allowed to worship other idols and deities. I wonder why. Because look what the other deities permit you to do. We are not permitted to behave like the world because look what the world permits us to do. And then it undercuts and enslaves and tortures and pesters its own. Cuts you down and kicks you while you're down. That's how the world treats its own. Why would you want to be part of the world? What are you missing out on by running? with Yahusha. So that's the story of the gang rape. Let's look at the consequence. So the Israelites called the meeting of the nation, a meeting of the nation, the United Nations of Yisrael. And since they were all Yahusha's people, the meeting was held at the place of worship in Mizpah. Men who could serve as soldiers came from everywhere in Yisrael, from Dan in the north, Beersheba in the south, Gilead, east of the Jordan River. 400,000 of them came to Mizpah and they all felt the same way about those disgusting men from the tribe. They all felt the same about what those disgusting men from the tribe of Benjamin had done. So they're all, they're all, it worked. As disgusting as he was sending her body around, it had its desired effect. They've all gathered together to discuss this matter, to have a summit. Let's repeat the fact that it was Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin who wanted to homosexually gang rape the Levite man, but then accepted his concubine to somewhat usage, their perverted sexual appetites. And they weren't satisfied until they killed her in the process. But it's equally as appalling that the Levite's response to all this, which was to butcher his concubine's corpse, was apparently considered justifiable when in fact the Levite ought to have been prosecuted for such a ghoulish dismembering of her. But such was the condition of Yisrael at the time, and generally throughout the period of the judges, that there is no hint of objection to his actions. 
something a serial killer would do. Cut, it, cut her up into pieces and drop her off the boat. Dealing with, with Dexter here. Remember Dexter? He used to do that. With his dark passenger. Then news about the meeting at Mitzpah reached the tribe of Benjamin. So all the tribes have gathered together and the Benjamites found out that they're all gathering together to discuss them. The tribal prince of Benjamin would have also received a portion of the concubine's body in expectation that he and his tribe would want to join their brethren in punishing the men of Gibeah. But the leadership of Benjamin chose to harbour the murderers instead. So of course they knew what was going on and that the other tribes were gathering for war. And as soon as the leaders of the tribes of Yisrael took their places, the Yisraelites said, Someone explain this hideous cock up immediately. How could such a horrible thing happen? Explain this hideous cock up. There were better words I wanted to use, but they were a bit too racy. Cluster F is a good one that came up when I, anyway, explain this cluster. Anyway, the husband of the murdered woman answered, my concubine and I went into the town of Gibeah in Benjamin to spend the night. Later that night, the men of Gibeah surrounded the house. They wanted to kill me. No, they didn't. But instead, they gang raped and killed my concubine. And these were Yishraelites, my brothers. How vile and disgraceful. So I cut up her body and sent pieces everywhere in Yishrael. So what are you all going to do about it? You're the people of Yishrael, aren't you? So bloody well make up your damn minds what should be done about those barbaric turds in Gibeah. What are we going to do about these filthy turds? Not surprisingly, he lied. The Levite told them that the men of Gibeah wanted to kill him, which was not the case at all. And things started off on a bad foot. And everyone was, was in complete agreement and made an oath. None of us will go back to our tents or back home. We'll send one tenth of the men from each tribe to get food for the army. And we'll ask Yehua who should attack Gibeah because those vile creatures deserve to be punished for committing such a horrible crime in Yisrael. It's astounding, and I guess it's not really because religion today does the same thing. Even the Messianics and Nazarim today do the same thing in Yahushua's name. They have the name of Yahuwah and Yahushua, but look at their behavior. It's astounding to me when I look at the text, they're still constantly, despite their polytheistic worship of all the other deities, they're still, when, when, when they're brought together, and they're at, and in the crux and it's happening. In the heat of the moment, they call out to Yahushua, they, Yahuwah, and they, they do it. They're always using Yahuwah's name. And yet look at their behavior, you know? Why is everything happening to them the way they are? Because you have been delivered in the name of Yahuwah. You've got him in your camp and look how you're behaving. So he's not in their camp anymore. So they need to be punished these vile creatures. And everyone agreed that Gibeah had to be punished. The tribe of Yisrael sent messengers to every town and village in Benjamin. And wherever the messengers went, they said, how could those worthless men in Gibeah do such a disgusting thing? We can't allow such a terrible crime to go unpunished in Yisrael. Hand the men over to us so we can put them to death. But the people of Benjamin refused to listen to the other Yisraelites. And men from towns all over Benjamin's territory went to Gibeah and got ready to fight Yisrael. They're sticking together with their brothers, their Benjamites. The Benjamin tribe had 26,000 soldiers, not counting the 700 who were Gibeah's best warriors. In this army, there were even 700 left-handed experts who could sling a rock at a target the size of a hair and hit it every time. This is no small thing. Those 700 stone slingers were deadly accurate and the stronger men could even sling stones that weighed up to a pound, weigh up to a pound each at 90 miles per hour speeds. So the other Israelite tribes organized their army and found they had 400,000 experienced soldiers. It's helpful to notice that the 400,000 soldiers of the combined Israelite army only represented two thirds of the size of the available army under Joshua. So there were reserves if needed. However, Benjamin was outnumbered almost 20 to one. So I imagine such a need was not even remotely contemplated. With the battle lines and forces set and described, the assault began. 
but not before the army of Yisrael went up to Bethel to consult with Yehusha. So they all went up to the place of worship at Bethel and asked Yehusha, which tribe should be the first to attack the people of Benjamin? Judah, Yehusha answered. Now Yehusha's response was not an audible voice, but through the Urim and the Thummim stones in the high priest's ephod. Remember those stones? Kind of, you got kind of a positive or negative answer. You could, choice of two options. We don't know exactly how the stones indicated the divine answer, possibly by a lot or maybe by one or the other of the two stones glowing maybe. But in no way did they speak you, no way did they hear Yahusha's voice or was any other audible means employed that was recorded. So the next morning the Israelite army moved its camp to a place near Gibeah. Then they left their camp and got into a position to attack the army of Benjamin. Benjamin soldiers came out of Gibeah and attacked. And when the day was over, 22,000 Yishalite soldiers lay dead on the ground. Even though Yishrael had more soldiers than Benjamin, 22,000 Yishalite soldiers dead that day. Then the people of Yishrael went to the tabernacle and cried until sunset. And they asked Yehusha, should we attack the people of Benjamin again, even though they are our relatives? Yes, Yehusha replied, attack them again. So the Israelite soldiers encouraged each other to be brave and to fight hard. And the next day they went back to Gibeah and took up the same positions as the day before. And that same day, Benjamin's soldiers came out of Gibeah and attacked, leaving only, sorry, leaving another 18,000 Israelite soldiers dead on the battlefield. So the people of Israel went back to the tabernacle of Bethel where the Ark of the Blood Covenant Witness was being kept. They sat on the ground crying and not eating for the rest of the day. Then about sunset, they offered sacrifices to please Yahusha and to ask his blessing. Then Phineas, remember Phineas? Aaron's son, I think it was. I think we'll find out. Phineas the high priest then spoke to Yahusha. Oh, Yahuwah, the people of Benjamin are our relatives. The people of Benjamin are our relatives. Should we stop fighting or attacking them again? This was a big deal to them because they, they only went to war with the Canaanites or with the surrounding nations. They never warred amongst themselves, unless it was a slap in the face or something. They never, this is a massive civil war. Look how many thousands of people are dying. So they're pretty upset about it. They're killing their own people, their own brothers. So should we stop fighting or attack them again? Attack, Yahushua answered. Tomorrow I will let you defeat them. Here we find that the war priest for Yisrael was none other than Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, there you go, Aaron's grandson, whose resolute action of using a spear to run through the Midianite woman and Hebrew man who were having intercourse inside the camp of Yisrael, killing them both, saved Yisrael from Yehushua's wrath. Remember that story back in Numbers or Deuteronomy? He put a spear through both of them to stop the curse that was going on. Phineas's bold action when everyone else was paralyzed or utterly disinterested atoned for Yisrael's rebellion before Yehusha and ended a divine plague that had already killed 24,000 Israelites. This Phineas is one of the more unrecognized of scripture heroes. He had taken a lead role in the war against Midian and acted as a mediator during a time when the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan were suspected of disunity and apostasy due to the erection of a memorial altar. So, it's a bit about Phineas. Phineas is back on the scene. We've got an answer from Yehusha. Tomorrow I will let you defeat them. So the Yishalites surrounded Gibeah, but stayed where they could not be seen. Then the next day they took the same positions as twice before, but this time they had a different plan. They said, when the men of Benjamin attack, we will run off and let them chase us away from the town and into the country roads. The soldiers of Benjamin attacked the Israelite army and started pushing it back from the town. They killed about 30 Israelites in the fields and along the road between Gibeah and Bethel. Then the men of Benjamin were thinking, we're mowing them down just like we did before. And the Israelites were running away, but they headed for Baal Tamar where they regrouped. They had set an ambush and they were sure it would work. 10,000 of Yisrael's best soldiers had been hiding west of Gibeah. And as soon as the men of Benjamin chased the Yishalites into the countryside, these 10,000 soldiers made a surprise attack 
on the town gates. They dashed in and captured Gibeah, killing everyone there. Then they set the town on fire because the smoke would be the signal for the other Israelite soldiers to return and attack the soldiers of Benjamin. The fighting had been so heavy around the soldiers of Benjamin that they did not know the trouble they were in. But then they looked back and saw clouds of smoke rising from the town. They looked in front and saw the soldiers of Israel turning to attack. This terrified them because they realized that something horrible was happening. And it was horrible. Over 25,000 soldiers of Benjamin died that day. And those who were left alive knew that Yahushua had given victory uh, to Yisrael. The men of Benjamin headed down the road towards the desert, trying to escape from the Yisraelites. But the Yisraelites stayed right behind them, keeping up their attack. Men even came out of the nearby towns to help kill the men of Benjamin, who were having to fight on all sides. The Israelite soldiers never let up their attack. They chased and killed the warriors of Benjamin as far as a place directly east of Gibeah until 18,000 of these warriors lay dead. Some other warriors of Benjamin turned and ran down the road towards Ramon Rock in the desert. The Israelites killed 5,000 of them on the road then chased the rest until they had killed 2,000 more. 25,000 soldiers of Benjamin died that day. All of them experienced warriors, and only 600 of them finally made it into the desert to Rimon Rock, where they stayed for four months. Then the Israelites turned back and went to every town in Benjamin's territory, killing all the people and animals and setting the towns on fire. So Israel had the victory. But it's, it's a sad victory, really. When the Israelites had met at Mitzpah before the war with Benjamin, they had made this promise. None of us will ever let our daughters marry any man from Benjamin because of how they behave. Look what they've done to this woman. Concubine, gang rape, all that. We don't want anyone. None of our daughters are going to marry a Benjamite. But after the war with Benjamin, the Israelites went to the tabernacle at Bethel and sat there until sunset. They cried loudly and bitterly to Yahushua. O oh, Yahuwah, you are the Elohim of Yisrael. Why did you let this happen? Now one of our tribes is almost gone, like it was his fault. We love blaming Yahushua, don't we? Some time passed, the heat of the battle was over and the victorious Israelites had time to think over what had transpired and they fell into grief over it. They reflected on what the results of their actions meant for the future of Israel and they repented. Even though it was Benjamin who necessitated this war by their outrageous position of defending the deranged men of Gibeah who turned to homosexuality and behaved exactly as the heathens of Sodom and at the time it must have seemed reasonable that just as Yahushua annihilated Sodom, that the same justice upon Gibeah was in order. Perhaps Israel had gone too far. They got too excited about it and wiped them in. It says, says up there they wiped out the town, burnt all the towns and women and children. They slaughtered everybody. I think they got a bit excited. Early the next morning, the Israelites built an altar and offered sacrifices to please Yahushua and to ask his blessing. Then they asked each other, did any of the tribes of Israel fail to come to the tabernacle? We made a special promise that anyone who didn't come to the meeting at Mizpah would be put to death. The Israelites were sad about what had happened to the Benjamin tribe, and they said, one of our tribes was almost wiped out, and only a few men of Benjamin weren't killed in the war. We need to get wives for them, so the tribe won't completely disappear. But how can we do that after promising it? in Yahuwah's name, that we wouldn't let any let them marry any of our daughters. How can we do that? We promised in Yahuwah's name that we wouldn't let them marry any of our daughters. So we've got to get them wise, but we're not getting them from any of ours. The fact that one of Jacob's sons would lose his place among the family of Hebrews was too awful to contemplate. The fact that one of Jacob's sons would lose his place among the family of Hebrews was too awful to contemplate. In tribal society, it is one thing for interrelated tribes to war and kill amongst themselves in order to punish or achieve dominance. It is quite another to kill off an entire bloodline, and this was usually avoided at all costs. 
because it's still their nation. It's still their brother. You're practically wiping out one of the tribes. Again, the Yishlites asked, did any of the tribes stay away from the meeting at Mizpah? And after asking around, they discovered that no one had come from Jabesh in Gilead. So they sent 12,000 warriors with these orders. Attack Jabesh in Gilead and kill everyone, except the women who have never been married. So the warriors attacked Jabesh and Gilead and returned to their camp in Canaan with 400 young women. The Israelites met and sent messengers to the men of Benjamin at Rimmon Rock, telling them that the Israelites were willing to make peace with them. So the men of Benjamin came back from Rimmon Rock and the Israelites let them marry the young women from Jabesh. But there weren't enough women. So the Israelites were very sad because Yehusha had almost wiped out one of their tribes. Then the national leader said, all the women of Benjamin tribe were killed. How can we get wives for the men of Benjamin who are left? If they don't have children, one of the Yishalite tribes will die out. But we can't let the men of Benjamin marry any of our daughters because we made a special promise not to do that. And if we break our promise, we'll be under our own curse. So then someone suggested, what about Yahuwah's festival that takes place each year in Shiloh? It's held north of Bethel, south of Lebanon, and just east of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem. So the leaders told the men of Benjamin who still did not have wives, go to the Shiloh, go to Shiloh and hide in the vineyards near the festival. Wait there for the young women of Shiloh to come out and perform their dances. Then rush out and grab one of the young women. Then take her home as your wife. If the fathers or brothers of these women complain about this, we'll just say, be kind enough to let these men keep your daughter, please. After all, we couldn't get enough wives for all of the men of Benjamin in the Battle of Jabesh. And because you didn't give them permission to marry your daughters, you won't be under the curse we early agreed on. Well, so what big deal? That's not our problem, is it? You're not taking our daughters. Then the men of Benjamin went to Shiloh and hid in the vineyards. The young women soon started dancing and each man grabbed one of them and carried her off. It's like, like Neanderthal barbarians, isn't it? Ridiculous. Then the men of Benjamin went back to their own land and rebuilt their towns and started living in them again. And afterwards, the rest of the Israelites returned to their homes and families. That's the end of Judges. And then it says, just in case you're wondering what all this chaos and insanity is about. In those, just relax guys, because in those days, Yisrael wasn't ruled by a king. Clearly this was written, this account of judges was all written when there was a king. So people who are reading it are going, how is this even possible? Why didn't David, why didn't do something about it? And so the writer's saying, no, 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 just get this straight. Don't worry, in those days, Yisrael wasn't ruled by a king. That's why this is all this, wickedness, depravity, chaos is going on. Israel wasn't ruled by a king. So what did they do? How could they live? Everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. So that's why the author's saying it like this. Because everybody, even people reading it in the future would have been like, what the hell? And they're saying, no, no, there's a reason for this. There's no king. Yahushua's showing everybody, Israel, they need a king. The children born to the tribe of Benjamin from here forward were mixed. And in the time of King Saul, we're going to find an interesting relationship between Saul and the people of Gilead. When Ammon threatened the people of Gilead, they turned to Saul for help. Later, it would be the men of Gilead who recovered the bodies of Saul and his sons as their corpses hung on the walls of Bethshan. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin and so we see how and why the tribe of Benjamin had a special bond with the people of Gilead. In point of fact, they were closely related by blood and it happened as the aftermath of the war with Benjamin. A lot of the wives came from Gibeah, Gilead, sorry. A lot of the, the wives came from Gilead. So he, from here on out, Benjamin is kind of mixed. Final words of the book of Judges ends most appropriately with, at that time there was no king in Yisrael, a man simply did whatever he thought was right. We need to see that just as Yahushua was showing Yisrael that they needed a king, so do we need a king, and his name is Yahushua. Unfortunately, we are today reliving the times of the Judges. The state of the world, secular and religious, is as it was in the days 
of Othniel, Deborah and Samson, with everyone doing whatever is right in their own hearts, doing deeds that seem pious, religious and righteous, outwardly and comfortable to them inwardly, but paying no attention to the actual living words of Yahusha. And yes, I say this to all the Messianics in Naturum, which is just religion, part of religion to me. They've just adopted the, the name of Yahusha, but it's still religious behavior. I mean, look at them. Look what they're saying. Look what they're doing. Look how they're observing festivals. Look how they're, oh, but it's written in scripture. It's out of context. It's wrong. You know? You're not living the way Yahushua wants you to live. Real, sincere, flowing, changing. You know? Do we want to behave like they did here in Judges? I've harped on this the last few videos. Yahushua is not in any of this. He can't be in any of this behavior. Look at the scripture we did in our last episode that Victoria put up. How do we know what to do? Say things that are kind, uplifting, gentle, that bring peace, not hatred, you know, not chaos, not anger, bitterness. So that's been a bit of a slog going through Judges, wasn't it? Quite depressing there at times. And they're on a downward spiral. That's why I keep putting the downward spiral behind me in the introduction. They're in a downward spiral and they're in that cycle of being judged and have, they have peace. Then they go into idolatry. Then they get oppressed or fall into judgment by Yahushua, by the Canaanites moving in on them as judgment because they won't be obedient. And then they are in servitude for many years and then they cry out and cry out, woe is us, please deliver us. And, you, and Yahushua responds, raises up a judge, a shofetim, and they get delivered. And there's a certain amount of years of peace while the judge is alive. And then when the judge dies, just like when Moses and Joshua died, and uh, Aaron and his son, when they died, Eliezer, when they died, the lawlessness, you know, it's like that in religion today. People need to be looking to men to tell them what to do. No, you have the living creator in you. If you've been immersed, you have the creator of the universe living within you, teaching you, training you, flogging you, chastising you, goading you, you know, letting you know he hates your behavior. What are you going to do about it? You don't like the way you feel? Change your bloody behavior. It's the underlying theme of judges we've been going through. The transformation is happening. Look at the world. Wars and famines and rumors of wars and hatred and racism and nation against nation, rain against rain. You know, it's all happening. We've just been told yesterday that all of Queensland, well, we've, we've never even worn a mask for, for the last two years that all this madness is going on. We've never owned one. Had to go out and buy some black masks today to go with my shirt. You know, like it's insane because there's been a couple of cases in Queensland few cases in Australia, you know, it's insane. Look at the pandemic, look at the chaos, look at the judgment. I think Yahushua's coming back soon, don't you? Are you ready? Because when he comes back, fire, judgment, reapers, all that comes with him. And the only way that you're going to survive is if your flesh is rent and the perfection process is finished and you transformed in the twinkling of an eye so get with the program and respond to yahushua within you keep going you can do it you can do it <laughs>